In May of 2019, the Healthy Holly scandal forced her out of office and led to a three-year federal prison sentence. Tonight, Fox 45 is exploring the impact this possible commutation could have on a city with a history of corruption. We have team coverage of the transition of power. Let's begin with Jeff Abel and the plea from Baltimore's former mayor. Jeff. Well, in his final hours in office, President Trump is expected to show clemency to more than 100 felons just in the next few hours. And one of them now vying for his attention is former Mayor Catherine Pugh. Former Mayor Catherine Pugh admitted she laundered illegal campaign contributions and failed to pay taxes. And now, six months into her three-year prison sentence, the former mayor, now federal inmate, is asking for clemency. It doesn't surprise me that her, along with probably hundreds and thousands of other people, have decided, let's see what happens. With just hours to go before President Trump leaves office, some 14,000 felons are now pleading for clemency, including former Mayor Catherine Pugh who's asking the president to commute her three-year sentence, which would set her free some two and a half years early. Political analyst John Deedy believes her chances are good. The key for her that may help her is she's a nonviolent offender. So, yeah, corruption, definitely guilty of. But because she has not committed a crime that is seen as violent, her chances of getting a commutation are probably rather strong. The former mayor is no stranger to the president. Four years ago, she greeted him on the way into Raven Stadium, where she delivered a gift and a plea for federal help. I'm giving you this pen. Uh, this is a Baltimore pen. And every time you look at it, I need you to think of Baltimore. But months later, the president disparaged the city, tweeting that it's a rat and rodent infested mess. Now, the former mayor hopes for a more positive response with one final request of the president. Her pardon among a lot of people would cause some outrage in Baltimore because here's another politician getting off the hook. I think because of a lot of factors, it would soon probably be forgotten quickly. The former mayor isn't the only familiar name who has a petition at the White House. Also asking for clemency, we're learning tonight as former mayor or former police commissioner Ed Norris and former police sergeant Thomas Ellers, who's serving 15 years in prison for his role in the now defunct police task force. Maryland lawmakers taking an unprecedented step to make schools safer. It's Project Baltimore's Chris Papps explains officials continue to react to a Fox 45 News investigation that found a sex offender who was 21 years old was taking classes at a local high school. It's hard to believe that something like this could happen in the first place. A registered sex offender enrolled as a student at Parkville High School. But now lawmakers tell us a bill is currently in the legislature that would make Maryland the first state in the country to ensure that it cannot happen again. We, we just want to ask her why she allowed a 21 year old convicted sex offender to take classes in this school. When Project Baltimore first broke the news in January 2020, the community was stunned. How can this man, this uh, sex offender, be on the registry and still be sitting in a classroom with kids all around him? I was outraged. The taxpayers ought to be outraged. Santino Sudano, a 21 year old registered sex offender, enrolled at Parkville High School. He was taking classes until he was arrested a second time in December 2019, charged with second degree rape in a case involving a 15 year old county student. Soon after, a third underage victim came forward with similar accusations, leading to additional sexual assault charges. I cried. I cried tears of joy. I cheered to my boyfriend that I was finally getting justice after two years. Sudano is currently in jail without bond. His trial is set for May. We want our kids safe and we don't want sexual predators with them. When Fox 45 News broke the story, legislation was introduced in Annapolis to ban sex offenders from being students in a public school. It was passed unanimously in the Senate. Governor Larry Hogan supported it. But due to COVID, session ended early before the House could vote on it. I think it's shameful 
that the superintendent and the, and the principal here could not use some common sense to realize that's not a type of individual that you should let in this school. Now, one year later, the bill has been updated and reintroduced as House Bill 48. Delegate Joseph Botler supports the legislation, along with sponsors Delegates Carl Jackson and Harry Bendari. All of them represent Parkville. But it is, I think, a very good bill, and it takes that authority away from the superintendents and, and the principals like we had here at Parkville from making that decision as to what do we do with these sexual offenders. The legislation bans convicted sex offenders from being students inside Maryland public schools while setting up alternative means to educate them outside of the classroom. The bill also includes a penalty of up to five years in jail and $5,000 in fines if someone knowingly allows a sex offender into a school. The Parkville delegation tells Project Baltimore this bill is precedent setting. No other state in the country has taken similar action to protect students, and they hope others will follow Maryland. You know, if you're a parent and you got your child here, you'll know that at least they'll be protected from that kind of an individual. Because I think we have a responsibility to make sure that our children, when they're coming to these schools and they're being educated, that we protect them. The bill is considered emergency legislation, meaning if it is passed, it would take effect immediately. Project Baltimore will be following the bill as it makes its way through the legislature, and we will keep you updated. Maryland, the state reporting 1,700 new cases, the lowest figure since December 27th. Sadly, another 29 Marylanders have died, and the state has now administered more than a quarter million doses of the coronavirus vaccine. But there is concern tonight that the vaccination plan in Maryland may soon outpace the supply. It comes as Maryland advances to a new phase of vaccinations that includes anybody over 75 years old. Mackenzie Frost joins us live with what the governor is saying about this dilemma. Mackenzie? Mary, Governor Larry Hogan is warning Marylanders. Today's expansion greenlights more than 850,000 people to get the COVID-19 vaccine. But the problem, the state is only getting about 10,000 doses a day. And right now, the federal government says it's not planning on sending any more out to states for at least a few weeks. Over the last 10 months, more than 328,000 Marylanders have tested positive for COVID-19. Picture four and a half M&T Bank stadiums and then some full of people with the coronavirus. Fast forward to now, Governor Larry Hogan rolling up his sleeve to get the first of the two-dose COVID-19 vaccine. Wow, didn't he feel it? <laughs> encouraging everyone who can to do the same. It's the only way to end the damage to our economy and to bring this pandemic to an end. As of today, 21,800 Marylanders have been fully vaccinated, meaning 0.01% of the entire state who are eligible have gotten both doses. We have a pretty good plan. Despite dwindling supply nationally, Maryland moving forward, allowing more people to sign up for an appointment to get a vaccine. But the state's top doctor overseeing the rollout telling me on Friday. They are anticipating um, continuing roughly the same allocations that states are currently getting Today, the governor bluntly well, saying the demand is outpacing the supply coming from the federal government. They're giving them to us at uh, 10,000 a day. Uh, on Saturday, we did 25,000. Uh, I think we're averaging around 15,000. So 50% more than we're getting. That's why I kept saying we're going to run out. Hogan looking to abide an administration for change. The president-elect outlining a plan to speed up production and plans to use the Defense Production Act. The timing of the expansion unknown. While any federal stockpile of the vaccines is gone. Meantime, Baltimore City's Health Department has no open appointments for the rest of January for people looking to get their first dose of the vaccine. Now, Mary, I spoke with some people involved in the planning, and they say that the rollout of this vaccine plan is fluid and it could change as the Biden administration begins next week. However, they say that things could also improve as far as getting an online appointment. They're looking at making it easier for people to get a COVID-19 vaccine appointment, especially for those who don't have access to the Internet. Plus, they're also talking about the mass vaccine clinics. They say that those plans are still on the table. But again, the linchpin to get more people vaccinated all hinges on the availability of the doses coming into the state.
Smith and the path forward for restaurants in Baltimore. Friday, Mayor Brandon Scott chose not to lift restrictions on dining. Well, this weekend, some of the businesses impacted by the city's COVID mandates were able to speak directly to the man calling the shots. Fox 45 reporter Amy Simpson live tonight with what we know about that meeting. Amy? Mary, I'm told about two dozen restaurants were part of this virtual conversation with the mayor just yesterday to talk about restrictions and frustrations. It was a chance to have their voices heard. They are feeling desperate and they don't know how much longer they're going to be able to hold out with these restrictions. The president and CEO of the Restaurant Association of Maryland tells Fox 45 News he was a listener for Sunday's focus group discussion with Mayor Brandon Scott. They really impressed upon the mayor that uh, they need a timeline for when these restrictions are going to be list lifted. Uh, and that way they can make decisions on whether or not to close or to maybe try to hang on for another week or two. Thank you for calling Amici's. Can I help you? The city's restaurants have been restricted to takeout only operations since December 11th. Restaurants on the call reportedly told the mayor they're frustrated that customers can visit surrounding counties to dine with fewer restrictions. They also told him they need financial help to survive. Uh, I thought the mayor was uh, very receptive. But again, our decisions are made on public health, period. Scott has said time and time again, he's tracking hospitalizations, case rate and COVID deaths to guide restrictions. No decisions were made at this meeting. Uh, there were no commitments on any end. In a statement to Fox 45 News, the mayor's office calls the meeting productive and says both sides will keep an open line of communication as the pandemic continues. And while no metrics were given, no specific metrics were given for this dining ban to be lifted, the mayor had said on Friday that he would reevaluate restrictions in the middle of this week.